chapter 15. John chapter 15. Bring your Bibles to church. We're going to follow along as we go. We will have several scriptures that we will look at later on, but John chapter 15 will be our text. Let me take just a moment to explain how we get to this message on this day. Uh, this was the ticketed message for, I believe it was uh, February the 7th of when the ice came. Able to have service that morning due to the conditions of the parking lot on the road, and uh, this was down that week. And then typically, I would preach it the very next week, uh, which happened to be uh, what we call Valentine's Day. So, always good to preach on the love of God or something uh, correlated with that. We did that last week, and so uh, what we have this morning uh, is really a, a collision of our series in John on Sunday nights and our series of getting the victory on Sunday morning. And we're going to talk about how we can have the victory over something that I believe that at times every Christian here, every Christian alive struggles with. And I really want you to uh, just examine your own heart and soul this morning and ask God, how are you doing in this department? John chapter 15, uh, our Lord here often uses illustrations uh, to get across a point. A very familiar passage, man, so much here from uh, this passage that we're going to try to uh, squeeze into at least the first part of the passage into just two um, services, uh, but the last part, just to kind of give us a context before we stand and read um, the verses here, the last part of chapter 14, uh, we have the picture of Jesus and his disciples, and they're about to leave the upper room, and many believe and feel that what we're going to read this morning was the dialogue that Jesus had uh, with uh, his disciples as he was going, making his way to the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, there where he prayed what we call his high priestly a prayer, and then later, of course, arrested uh, by Judas and the soldiers that came. And so he speaks these words. That's kind of the setting to kind of help us understand um, even the intimacy that is felt here between him and his disciples. As this time is approaching, uh, let's look at what was on our Lord's heart and what was important to him. Would you so kindly stand with me if you're physically able? Uh, John chapter 15, as we honor the reading of God's word. We'll read down just to verse 11. Uh, will be the verses we pull two messages from, and we'll focus on just the first uh, six this morning. John 15, I am the true vine, beginning at verse 1, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. And he that abides in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. How I many of you know that? That principle to be true. <laughs> Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are Burn. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what it will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. That's his desire for us, to bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you. That my joy might remain in you, and your joy might be full. We'll look at the last part of those verses in the next message on this, but we'll focus on the first six this morning. And as I told you, we could we kind of collide our, our, our series on having victory with our series in John on Sunday night. And I want to preach a message this morning entitled Victory Over an Empty Basket. Victory Over an Empty Basket. But then what I'm very fearful that we have a lot of Christians carrying around an empty basket. And as I read and, and reread these verses again uh, this week and, and last night and just refocusing my mind on what God had for us, I can tell you God does not want us to carry around empty baskets. God wants our life to be full in Him and to be fruitful for Him. And so that's my challenge for all of this morning is to look upward and say, Holy Spirit, will you shine your light in my heart? I don't want to worry about anybody else beside me, in front of me, or behind me. But Lord, show me in my life areas I need to improve on. Victory over an empty basket. Through Him, abiding in Him, let me just say this and we'll pray. We can have the victory over an empty basket. 
Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this awesome reminder. There is so much here, Lord. We can almost preach, uh, Lord, a message on each verse that is presented here in this passage. But, Lord, we're going to try to collide these thoughts together. So, Lord, I ask you to guide my thoughts as I try to prepare not only my mind but my heart, Lord, in prayer, Lord, to present what you would have for us this morning. Lord, I do uh, want to be a Christian, uh, Lord, that has fruit in my baskets, not for my own self. Um, glorification, Lord, but to honor and glorify you, to be obedient to the command uh, that you've called us to do, and Lord, to be an outward sign that I'm abiding in you and, and walking with you. And so, God, I pray to help every Christian, Lord, I, I trust that all of us have that same desire to bear forth fruit that you have commanded for us to do, but Lord, help us to have the proper understanding of what you're talking about here, Lord. Help us to have the desire and help us to take the steps necessary um, to do and, and to bring forth the fruit as you've called us to, Lord. Hide me behind the cross. I'm just your mouthpiece, Lord, so that you pray that no one will focus on me or my words, but your Holy Spirit will penetrate the heart and will hear the spiritual truths that, that are in this passage this morning. God, we need you. Your presence is here, but we ask you again for a fresh anointing, for your power upon us this morning. It's in your son's precious name we do pray and ask these things. Amen. Thank you so kindly for standing. You may be seated. Here in this chapter, you know, and even the kids sing a song about it. When I was uh, on the way to church with Landon this morning, he comes in the morning and, and helps me get things set up and ready. He said, Daddy, what are you preaching on this morning? And I said, well, I'm preaching on Jesus is the vine and we're the branches. And he pointed up and said, hey, I know a song about that. You know, I, I sing the song, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. It's better over me is love. And so a very simple truth, I understand that, but yet a very profound message here is Jesus certainly is pictured as the true vine, and, and we certainly are pictured as the branches. So before you can apply this message, you got to kind of know where you fit, right? And we fit as the branches. We are the branches of the vine. And then, the, of course, the verses go on to tell us that God is the father or the gardener, the husband, the farmer of, of this branch, if you will. Now, let's, again, get the understanding in our mind to help us as, to see the setting. I can imagine during this time of year as Jesus and his disciples were very possibly on their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. And they were, at uh, this time of the year, the grapevines were beginning to blossom with the promise of fresh harvest. And I believe as the Lord uh, walked through and he began to see some of this process beginning, what a perfect illustration for him to, to drive home a spiritual truth to his disciples. Jesus was the master at illustrating things. And so here he gives us an illustration in the entire text for us to lean on this morning, an object lesson, as it were, to teach his disciples the spiritual message and application he wanted them to take. He, he had a desire to teach them about what I call the most vital relationship in their life. The most vital relationship in their life. We hear a lot about relationships today, do we not? from TV shows and media and society and work and all kind of stuff. But here the Lord zeroes in on, on the most important relationship all of us can have, and that is with Jesus and his Father. So just two points this morning. Note the first one, the person of the true vine. The person of the true vine. The first few, few verses of our text this morning give us this, and you see the word husband in there. That means that vine dresser, the gardener, the one who has the responsibility of caring for the vineyard. Jesus says that the Heavenly Father is the gardener. So we get the picture here that Jesus is the vine, His Father is the gardener, and we are just the branches that we will get to as we unfold these verses. But there's a key phrase in verse 2 I want you to see. Go back and read verse 2. It's every branch in me. Every branch, next two words, in me. That's a very important phrase that we need to grab onto now and hold on to throughout the, um, the, the course of this message. This lets us know that we are dealing with genuine believers. Folks that are in Christ. Folks that are in me, Jesus says. Folks that have received him and believe in him. He's not talking about the wheat and the tares here. He's not talking about the tares at all. He's talking about the wheat, the genuine believers. So the gardener is involved in everything that has to do with the vine. And then this verse zeroes in on three specific duties of the gardener. Who's the gardener? The Father. God the Father. So, this, these verses zero in on three specific duties, if you will, of the gardener that he's involved in in regard to the vine. Now, I'll give you the first one. The first one is protection. The first one is protection. The gardener provides tender watch care and protection for the vineyard. How many of you have ever done any gardening? 
Now, many of you in here, some of you maybe um, still do that, and, and I know, um, you know, you know the process very well. When you're trying to grow something, you've got to kind of protect that, and you've got to kind of put uh, barriers up. And I know as I was uh, visiting some of our folks not too long ago, and they were showing me uh, their garden and, and how they had said that, preacher, I had to put this little fence around it because if I don't, little critters come from the woods and they eat everything, they destroy everything. And they got to protect that, and you'll do different things, and, and you'll watch for the weeds, and, and you'll try to take care for, you'll give careful attention uh, to them. And I just like to pause right here and say, aren't you glad um, that the Father protects us? Aren't you glad that He sees all? Aren't you glad that He knows every critter that's going to come falling out of the woods that could destroy on the vine or the harvest that is coming from the vine? And I'm so thankful that just as the gardener here pictured in this il- illustration protects the vineyard, so our Heavenly Father protects you and me. Remember, we're the branches. We're the branches. We don't have to rely on our own strength, but He protects us. And I'm so thankful that I praise the Lord for the sure knowledge that nothing this is the heavenly gaze of our Heavenly Father. You've done more gardening than I have, but inevitably, if you've done a lot of it, at some point, you probably missed a little something, right? You come back and you realize, uh, my neighbor, uh, where we currently live, he, he has so much growing in his backyard, and, and I walk over there and he'll show me, or he'll go bring some, I'm over to the door, and he'll tell me, he said, well, preacher, so-and-so, um, whatever animal he calls, I said, they got all mine, and he'll mention uh, whatever they destroyed. I'm thankful that Heavenly Father doesn't miss anything. Amen? He sees it all. He protects us. He knows what's coming our way. Even when we don't, Proverbs 15, verse 3 reminds us of this truth. The first part of that verse says, The eyes of the Lord are where? In every place. They're in every place. So He doesn't miss a row. He doesn't miss a twig. He doesn't miss anything. He's there to protect us. Think about it this way. Parents, um, we're very protective over our kids, are we not? We should be, especially as they're growing up and that such a young and tender and impressionable age, not only for their physical well-being, but protecting their heart and their minds and their eyes and their ears, right? Protecting all those things. And by the way, that's what we should do. And, and when they get a little bit older, with God's grace and the right relationship, He protects them. Amen? I, I know the reins loosen, I know things change, but we can still be a guidance for them. But think about at the young age, and, and we protect them from everything. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. We have such a, a long list that we could formulate of the things we want to protect our kids from, and rightly so. But as they do get older, our ability to watch them every minute of the day begins to fall. Because it begins to vanish away. They say, you know, they're going off to, to school all day, and then once they get old enough, they're staying after practice, and you, you'll say goodbye to them at 7, uh, 15, 7.30 in the morning, and, and you'll see them back if they if they participate in any kind of um, extracurricular activities at their school, and depending on when those practices are, or whatever those trips are, you, they'll get home at 5, 30, 6 o'clock, and you eat supper together, and I hope you do that, and then they'll go off and do homework and study for tests, and, and then you hopefully get together for a time of prayer or ground the Word, family devotion, and then they're going to bed, and then they do the same thing. Your time to watch them becomes smaller and smaller. And you can't protect them. But that's not the case with our Heavenly Father, amen. Regardless of how far we get, by the way, regardless of how far away from Him we get, He still sees us, He sees all, and He protects us. I'm thankful for His protection this morning. Second of all, though, look at the second B. Not only the protection, but notice the pruning. The pruning. You're very familiar with this when it comes to gardening and raising things. You understand it's a very important stage that the vine, the branches, must go through. As we apply this spiritually, it's a very important stage that every Christian must go through. I believe it's an important stage that every uh, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, God-honoring church must go through. So the gardener uses four primary methods of purifying his vineyard. And I don't know all these, so I had to look them up. And I won't give you the, the long, uh, maybe somewhat boring um, definitions of them, but just mention them and kind of give you a snapshot of what they stand for. The first type of pruning um, that the gardener will do is called tipping or pinching. You familiar with that? Tipping or pinching. And he'll come through and he'll, he, it slows the growth down of the top of that branch so that it does not grow too rapidly. 
Because although he's impressed initially with the, the, the growth and how fast it's going and how fast it's taking off, he realizes that if it grows too fast, it'll hurt the rest of the branch and it'll hurt the other branch because it'll suck the growth out of the all of that one bird. And so he comes back and he has to kind of tip them off and pinch them off at the top a little bit. That's the first method of pruning. Second method is called topping where it comes back in a little more detail, with a little more aggression. He'll, he'll take off one to two a foot of a new growth and he'll remove it from the top. Just like it says, topping. He'll come to the top of that, that branch that is sprouting out and he'll, he'll just, uh, one to two feet, he'll just cut off and, and take the complete top, the growth off because, again, too much growth at the top will kill the growth in the other area. So he knows if it's all concentrated in just one spot, that hey, he's going to have one good spot there, but the rest of the branches coming off the vine is not going to have the growth and nutrition that they need to grow. And so he'll come through from time to time, and as he examines each and every branch, by the way, how many of you know the Father examines each and every branch? That's you and me. And as he comes through and he examines that, there's sometimes that he has to, to take us through that pruning process, and he has to maybe top us off a little bit that, in, in order to accomplish and have the desire of uh, uh, results that he wants to have in our life. Then there's a third process called thinning. Thinning. It goes through and some are taken off or away of the branch, taken off or away of the vine by allowing, and what this does, it allows the remainder of the fruit to be sweeter, to be bigger, to be longer lasting. Listen, it's something that you look at and you're like, man, but, but that fruit was doing so good. That branch was doing so good. It was growing so well. And it was kind of ahead of the owns, if you will. But yet the Heavenly Father, the gardener, comes through and he, he inspects it. And he says, listen, this, this is sucking too much. And if I allow this to continue on, I'm going to have one good branch. But all the other branches are going to suffer. He said, I've got to bend through this vine a little bit. I've got to go through the thinning process so that all of this vine, every branch coming off of it, can produce fruit that is sweeter, that is bigger, and that lasts longer. They concentrate all the efforts into just one area or one branch in this case. Then the fourth process is this, the taking away that you saw the words there um, in the beginning of our text, cutting completely off, which indeed gives more nourishment to the whole plant. Let me just let me just say the obvious here. Pruning always hurts. Amen. Oh me. But pruning always hurts. Pruning in our spiritual lives is a painful process, but we have got to remember that the result of God's pruning in our lives at the end of the day, it will benefit you. It will help you. Listen, it will help you and me bring forth more fruit at the end of the day. And even though the pruning is not desired, even though the pruning is not fun, even though it does not feel good, it is for our good. And we have to trust the gardener. We have to trust the Heavenly Father during the pruning process. Psalms 119.71, if you want to write that verse down, Psalm 119.71 says this, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Now, stop right there. How many of you want to sign up for that part, folks? But when it's good for me that I've been afflicted, hallelujah, I'm going through trouble. Praise the Lord, I've had some hard times. I mean, what's the psalmist talking about? He said, it's good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn, he word, thy statutes. It's good for me, Lord, that I'm going through this pruning process because I know at the end of the day it is going to make me more like you. Talk about the fruit basket here in a minute. That's the main thrust of the message of the text. Us becoming more like Him. Us becoming more like Him. And how many times do you understand as branches we grow in the wrong direction and we try to grow too fast or we're not growing fast enough or we, we get off course a little bit here and the gardener has to come through and prune us back. To prune us back a little bit. That's what's taking place here. But Although it's a painful process, we know at the end of the day, it's for our good, it's for our benefit. This means that the gardener, uh, when we get, or even when we get to place in our Christian life, we go ahead and see the spiritual application where we're unfruitful, or we're barren, and, and we're not producing like God wants us to produce, and our basket may be more empty than it is full, if you will. What does the Heavenly Father want? It's 
to go back to the He has to reshape us. He has to bend us. He has to go through those process of, of bringing us. Why? To hurt us? To inflict pain? To make our lives harder? To make our walk with Him more difficult? No! To bring a beautiful result at the end. We've got to trust the gardener. Just to trust the gardener as much as at times in our life as branches, we want to we want to kind of move away. Say, no, don't cut, no, don't prune me, no, don't trim me down. Everything just fine in my life. Leave me alone. And then follow up. Time for pruning, and it goes through this process to help us, to challenge us, to increase the growth or the fruit in our life. Sometimes it disturbs disturbs our slumber. He will lift us out in an effort to challenge us and shock us back in the growth, if you will. And we've noted it is not always fun, but it is always necessary. Not always fun, but it is always necessary and helpful. And there are times when the Lord can only accomplish this through chastisement. Through chastisement. I believe there are times that He comes just as a loving shepherd would to the sheep, and He lovingly just kind of taps us a little bit and says, Hey, I need you to get this in line. Hey, I need you to trim this up a little bit. Hey, I need you to, to get back doing this or to get here or to be this or whatever it is. But if we do not heed to His still small voice, sometimes it leads to chastisement. And He has to judge us. And He has to get us our attention in order to get us out. And by the way, I don't know if you understand that when you spank your kids, it's not for fun. It's not because you have nothing better. Not because you get glory out of it. But there's been a time I've applied the biblical principle of spanking my kids that have ended up in tears on top of the And I understand what that is. It doesn't hurt as more than it hurts. It doesn't cost me. But that's what God does to us. It's not love them. Love them and just like discipline the kids. You do what you your flesh does not want to do, but you teach them and train them and you keep boundaries around them and you apply God's word to their life so that when they get older, they'll be better and good for you. We don't have to serve the Lord quietly. When God comes after us, I want to challenge you before we move on. Respond with a spirit of repentance. Respond with a spirit of humility and submissiveness to His will. It will help you be more fruitful to His glory. And listen, here's the tough thing, y'all, to keep in mind. That's why I love this little encroachment portion. The gardener that encroaches you will be there. You know what I'm saying? spiritual and health by the word of God. Look at verse 3 and it says it. Now we are clean, how are we clean? Through the word. May our fruit both come to the word of God. In your personal devotion, in your corporate gathering where the word of God is preached, that clean comes to us. As we listen to God speak to my heart through his word, I want to know He wants to make this thing to, to shape me and to, to help me be the Christian he would have us to become this day. How does the word of God play this role in our life? Of course, in James 1, 23, 24, the Bible says the word of God is like a mirror. It reveals our thoughts. We've all said on this verse before, we may be clean and pure, but if anybody get up this morning and look into the mirror, Just your hair. Some of us have less to worry about than others, but you still got a little gushing to it. You didn't have to get cobwebs out of your eyes. You didn't have to clean out the nose yet. I mean, is anybody ready to go this morning? Let's go. Great question. Did anybody go in and after after getting yourself back together from what you saw? Did anybody just walk away from the mirror and get dressed up like you were? Some of you look like shit. You don't want to like it this morning. Very practical application, right? We look into the mirror. We see there's some cases, a lot of things we need to fix, and we begin taking action. Cleaning up, that's the 
that's the invitation. That's the word of God. We go right now. We look into the spiritual mirror, folks. When we look into the spiritual mirror, we got, whoa, I can see that. Whoa. I didn't know that was big enough. And we got to start doing what thing? Amen, you with me? We got to start making changes. Because it's the Word of God. It's our spiritual mirror. It's the things that we've got to do. Look at the second illustration we're given. Not only is the Word of God, which proves us like a mirror, which we understand, but it's also like a knife. The Word of God cuts to the heart. Let me read you a verse right now to reference if you would like Hebrews 4.12. The Bible says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, let's just be all be honest because it starts with me. How many times after we've been in the Word of God together, you walk out and say, Oh, that hurts. That's a sharp knife. Man, it could go in and it could come back out. It's a two-edged sword, the Bible says. Piercing, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and it is a discerner of the faults and intents. The Word of God is like a knife that skillfully cuts away what does not need to be. Think about it this way. Okay, the Bible says sometimes, well, let's just let's think about this illustration. You go see the doctor. The doctor diagnoses the problem. He says, hey, get a second opinion if you want to get back. I'm pretty sure you get a second opinion about it. The diagnosis comes back. He says, we need to go in. We need to operate. We need to cut. We need to get this taken care of. If we don't, it can potentially cause more damage. Now, how many of you just like the idea of the doctor cutting on you? Just give me a hand. We're all in the same boat. But how many of you realize that something's wrong with your body? Have potential to get worse, and it can cause other problems, and it can go downhill very fastly. That the knife may be the best option. The knife is good. Now, how many of us know that we have something in our body that needs to be addressed in some way, that needs to be cut out from its application, and we just walk away from the doctor and say, you know what, doctor? I'm good. I'm good. Keep your blade to yourself. I'll get through this. This spot is worse. Although you're the application, although it may not be desirable, how many know sometimes piercing even the divine side? Taking our life straight, pruning us, as it were, as we're talking about here. The Word of God prunes us like a mirror, like a knife. So let's understand God has to and will prune us. It's an accepted fact. Listen to me, by the way, if He's never pruning your life, you got more to be worried about. It's a pruning process because if we're his child, if we abide in him, if we're attached to the vine, then he wants to accomplish in us what he desires for us. So the question this morning is not leaving here, oh, preacher, will I be pruned or how will I have a no? The question we leave here asking this morning is how has the Lord begun speaking to you through his word? Listen, for many of you, he may be trying to prune you right now through the word of God. Are you listening? Are you allowing him to expose you in the mirror and say, oh, me, I've got to fix that before anybody sees me. That'll scare somebody. How we understand sometimes he takes out the knife of his word and he wants to chisel away and he wants to cut away, but we cannot resist him. Although it's not fun, it's necessary. We have to allow God to, to prune us and to work on our lives. Have you been heeding the call from the Lord? Have you been accepting His Word? If not, then I challenge you, allow the Lord to prune your life with His Word. With His Word. It is a pruning tool. It is not an accomplished that He will. Hey, by the way, it's a pruning. It's a gentle, gentle pruning. Does it work for you? God's got other methods. God's got other methods. I want to get this word always. Let's just accept it this morning. Before we even see the negative location, just accept it because God has better methods. Number two, you see the person is too bound out as quickly as the person is held too bound. The person of too bound. Notice, first of all, there's a distinct purpose. There's a distinct purpose. The vine has the purpose of producing. Pretty simple, right? The vine has the purpose of producing. Fruit. The vine exists for that purpose, and without the fruit, the vine and all of its efforts would be wasted. It's not producing a fruit on the branches, so that, that is why it's there. We've got to understand that. And, and go ahead and make sure you connect it if you haven't already. The spiritual application here. Who do we represent? Who do we represent? We're not the gardener. That's 
the Heavenly Father. We're not the vine. That's Jesus. So we are the, there we go. Say again. We are the, we're the branches. And so we've got to realize the branches are the very things that bring forth fruit when we're properly attached to the vine, which is Jesus. So the purpose there of the vine then is to produce fruit in the branch that's a single purpose to bear fruit for the glory of God. And God wants to bear fruit in our lives. He does. But He wants to give us fruit in our basket so that we can have victory over the empty basket. So we don't have to walk around with the empty basket. So we don't have to stand before an almighty God one day with nothing in our basket. I want something in the basket. Amen. I want to have some fruit for the Lord. I hope you share that desire in our Christian world. It serves a distinct purpose, but another second of all, there's a distinguished purpose. Distinguished purpose. The reason the vine desires to produce fruit is so that the vine dresser may receive the honor and the glory. Can you understand something real quick here, church? It's not about you and it's not about me. Amen. Amen. It's all so that the gardener, the husband, and the dresser, whatever you want to call him, he receives all the glory. You got to get ourselves out of the way. We've got to get our selfishness out of the way. We've got to get our pride out of the way. As branches just attached to the vine, it's not about us. It's all about Him. It's not about the size of a church. It's all about faithfully producing fruit. And when fruit is yielded in the vineyard, the vine, the branches, the soil, none of those things get the credit. The gardener does. The gardener does. And for those that know things about a garden, when you walk by and you see, yes, the soil has a part of it, yes, the branch and the vine has a part of it. When you walk by and you see something beautiful that's producing fruit, you know someone's been carefully tending to it. Someone's been protecting it. Someone's been taking care of it along the way. And so that person receives all the glory. All the glory passes on to the the gardener, excuse me. And this is the case with the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything he did and that we do here to glorify God, it's all for his glory. Think about the life of our Lord when he was here. His earthly ministry. Where everything was about God. Everything was about the Father. He was glorifying and lifting up and honoring his Father. Our lives ought to honor God. Do you see that? Say amen. Our lives ought to honor Him. Let's not get caught up in trying to please one another. Let's just please Him. Amen? Let's please Him. And, I, and I've said that if we please God with our lives, we won't please everybody. I mean, you learn that's impossible to do. You can't please everybody, no matter what you do. But if we please God, then we will not please everybody. But we can't please everybody that we should. They're a part of the kingdom of God and will be able to do things for His honor and for His glory. This ought to be the burning desire of every child of God this morning. What if we all strive in our lives so that every waking minute, every waking minute of our day, we're filled with Him? Our goal is to bring God the glory. Hey, think about this thought just for a minute before we walk. How would that change the way you do? How would that change the way I do? How would that change the things that you do? How would that change the things that I do? If everything we did throughout the day applied, or we applied for Corinthians ten thirty one, which says this: You know, where whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, can you finish the verse? Do all, do all, do all to the glory of God. Lord, in every minute of our day, we have that goal, that desire to please Him in everything that we say. And do. He sustains us. He cares for us along the way. Yes, He comes and prunes us, but it's for our own good. And we are to honor Him. We are to honor Him. We can see there is also a delegated purpose. A delegated purpose. The vine itself, think about this, the vine itself does not bear full fruit. You know what I'm talking about? The vine itself does not bear full fruit. The branches have the obligation of bearing fruit. But here's a liberating thought. The vine has the responsibility of giving us what we need to bear that fruit. Well, we've got to understand the goal here. The vine isn't the one, he isn't the one supposed to bear for us. The branches are. You and I, but I'm thankful I don't have to rely on my own strength to do that. Amen? I have to rely on the power that the, the vine gives us, the power that, that he supplies for us everything we need to bear fruit in our life. The qualification for fruit bearing, let's look at this quickly. First of all, the branch must be attached to the vine. Pretty simple, right? 
Any time in your yard or your garden, something falls off, a twig, a branch falls off of the vine, what happens to it? It dies. It turns brown. And you take it and you, you rip it together, you pull it together, and you go throw it in the woods or you throw it in the burn pile. As the text says, hey, if we're going to bear fruit in our lives, we've got to be attached to the vine. And man, verse 5 gives us a verse, uh, a talk, or verse 4, abide in me. It's a whole nother message that you can just preach on that verse alone. But folks, if we're not bearing fruit in our life, it may be because we're not abiding in him like we should. I'll be attached quite like we should. And for many people, they may get frustrated and preach, I just don't see the fruits of the Spirit. But that's how I'm going to end the service this morning. I don't see these fruits that you're talking about. I don't see these things that are evident, should be evident. I just don't see them in my life. But let's just get real honest with the Lord. He may not be attached to us. Because He makes it clear that if we're attached in Him and we're abiding in Him and He abides in us, then we will bear forth fruit. There will be uh, evidences in our life that we've got some fruit in the basket. We've got some fruit in the basket. Folks, if we don't, we just got to get honest before God and say, God, why am I not bearing any fruit? Why is my life not, not, not producing any fruit? Why is there none of the, the elements of the fruit of the Spirit? Why are they not captivating my life? Why do I struggle with these things, Lord? Am I abiding in you like I should? Because I know the closer I get to the vine, the closer I get to Him. The more I get um, uh, like the vine, the more I'm like Him. The more that I'm, uh, I'm doing everything in my day around Him, the more His life is seen in me. Amen? And that's the desire of every Christian. To be less like Him. To become more and more like Him. It's a vital union between the believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, you know, oftentimes use this line and it's getting another message another time, but they say, Well, you're talking about my fruit preacher. Don't don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge me. Let me understand that's that's out of context of how it's used. But I need to also understand the Bible says that we are to expect the fruit. Come on now, I, I know this may get on some of our toes, but it's, it's, it may cut a little bit. It may scare us a little bit when we look to the Word, but we are to expect fruit. So, folks, if there's no fruit in your life, or if the fruit that's evident in your life is rotten, then you've got to allow the Lord to produce the fruit. You've got to allow Him to cut out what He needs to, to take away what He needs to, to make the adjustments that He needs to. It's not judging a soul, it's just looking at their life, it's just looking at their fruit, and we want all things to point to God and to bring honor and glory to His name. Let's move on to the letter B. Not only must we be attached, but we must abide in the vine. We must remain close to in fellowship. I'm going to try to hasten through this and, and close it off. This is such a such an awesome thought here. We can only produce fruit in our lives when we it can only be accomplished when we're abiding in him. Not just fire insurance. Not just saved and I'll live how I want to. Not just saved and then I'll just do what I want to. Not just saved and I'll carry around an empty basket for my whole life and tell Lord, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. We've got to abide in Him. And when we do that, we will produce fruit in our life. It will be evident. If we are not abiding in our Christian lives, we'll be fruitless and barren. And my dear friend, I fear that we have a lot of Christians that are fruitless and barren in the Christian life. And we've got to go back to what Scripture says. We've got to abide in Him. I remind you that fruit bearing is a passive activity on the part of the vine. It's a passive activity on the part of the branch. Preach what do you mean? The branch, if we'll just simply abide in the vine, then the vine will most certainly produce its fruit in our life. Isn't that a good thought? Isn't that a good thought? If we'll just simply abide in the vine, then he will produce. Just don't think about what I have to be carrying on my own. If I just take, stay close to the vine and stay attached and abide in Him, He'll produce fruit in my life. He'll make the fruit in my life uh, evident to others to see. I ask you this morning, are you bearing much fruit for the Lord? Are you bearing much fruit for the Lord? I'm reading some of your faces right as I preach this message. This last part maybe will help you because you're, you're wondering. You're wondering how that fruit looks. You're wondering what that fruit is. You're wondering how to go about bearing that fruit. That's how I want to close this morning. When we speak of bearing fruit, what do we mean? It's important to realize that in this text, that this is the overriding emphasis of this part of the chapter. Bearing fruit is the challenge. Bearing fruit is the challenge. Why? I want us to leave you with the challenge of not having an empty basket, getting victory over that empty basket by having fruit in our baskets 
So what do we mean by that? Before we get to an exact you take careful examination of your heart right now. Just ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me, Lord. I, I want my branch to be full of fruit. But Lord, if I'm growing or if I'm doing something wrong, well, I want you to correct me, even though it's painful. Take careful examination. Well, fruit bearing can be all the way. God will want to keep it. Here's some basic ideas for us. We'll close. First one, the first one comes to mind, and I'll mention them. We'll talk about the other two. Because they're all equally important. I just, I'm going to start with this one. It's actually the last one on this one. I think it's the first one in your mind. And that is soul. I mean, naturally, when we think of bearing forth fruit, we think about having an awesome fruit that we just don't enjoy. Jimmy has blessed me so much. God's got me. He's back in church and his life's back on track. He's already talking to me. He said, Preacher, we, we're trying to set an appointment to go see, see a fruit. Go talk to somebody about fruit. Why? Because that's the desire of the heart of the Christian. That there's some fruit. And, and, and this is not a soul winning message. We went through that back uh, over the last summer, but, but I do want to ask you this question. When you stand before God, in our imaginations, are there going to be anybody standing there saying, Hey, I'm here because I want someone to say, Share with me. Tell me about your fruit. Hey, I'm here, Lord, because maybe your sister. I tell you how real this is. We had a couple for the first time in service last year. And our folks have been invited to dinner by their church for four years. And they did not want to share about God's fruit with us. We need it. We don't give up. Don't give up. Soul is certainly a part of fruit. But here, church, I tell you what, you misunderstand me. That's not the only fruit we need to produce. Now, if you just said, whew. Yes, we need to go after souls. Yes, we all, when we kick our, our, our evangelism back off this spring, we're hoping to have more participation in everybody and be obedient and go and do what God. But that's not the only fruit that we can see in our life. Look at the second S, and that is sanctification. Sanctification, this is we become more like God. More of His attributes are seen in our life. More of his, uh, uh, the things that, uh, his characteristics are seen in our life. More of the fruit that Christ looks for. It's, that's what he looks for in us. It's, it's what is produced by him. Listen to Romans 6, 22. The Bible says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, we have your fruit unto holiness. How many of you where you want to be with the Lord right now? We all got room to grow, don't we? We all desire to get closer to the Lord. And listen, sanctification, we preached on this or mentioned a while back, it starts with salvation, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't end until glorification. So it's a daily process of getting closer to God each and every day. It's not something that we'll obtain fully here. But we're to work at it every day. We're to work at it every day. Fruit, more and more of His attributes becoming obvious and evident in our life. And then the third um, fruit, that we should see, yes, souls, yes, sanctification, becoming more like God each and every day in our lives, but then thirdly, spiritual, or spirituality. That is, we behave more like Him. Our actions are more like Him. In John 15, Jesus is looking for the fruit of His life in us. Think about that. In other words, He wants to see the fruit of His life in us. Remember, Jesus is the vine. He's providing everything to us as the branches we need to bear forth. Don't you think that you start to look, looking more and more like Him? The longer you change it, the more you will change it. I believe so. We look more and more like Him according to the Word of God. If following the characteristics are not present in our lives that I'm about to give you, then we must face the fact that we may not be true believers. Now, I know that is a bold statement and it makes the list very important. But let's close here by turning over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, because we talked about fruits we cannot leave out of this all-important part. Galatians chapter 5, we'll close with these two verses. Oh, don't miss this. And listen, this is where you just open up and say, God, speak to me. What's missing in my life? What fruit is not in my basket? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. You know these verses so well. The Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long suffering or patience, gentleness, goodness, faith or faithfulness, meekness, temperance. Against there is no such thing. Wow. Wow. Again.
again right here. These verses can give us a whole nother message, but let's just look at these quickly as we close. Fruits that are in our basket is our life loving. And we've talked about that in recent uh, weeks, so we're not going to spend time here. But is Christ's love seen in us and the way we act and the way we live? Second of all, joy. When we spend some time back in December talking about the joy of the Lord, we can have it, folks. We can have it. Listen, by the way, the joy of the Lord is just an outward sign that we're attached to the vine like we should be. Even when you can't be happy, even when you're down, even when things are tough, we can still thankfully have the joy of the Lord. Peace, patience, man. How many people lay down their head at night and they just don't have no peace? Don't have no peace. But listen, we can have that fruit in our basket, patience. Kindness, man, I told you, I said, a week ago, our generation, we just need a revival of kindness. We need a revival of kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not hard to say much for you to understand these words. I'm just asking you, I'm not the Holy Spirit to touch you and speak to you. Look in the mirror at those attributes that we're given, part of the fruit of the Spirit, part of the fruit that should be in our basket. And let's look in our basket of our heart. Let's see what's missing. See what I've missed. And let's ask God, Lord, I want to produce that fruit. Lord, I want to stay attached to you and produce that fruit. Lord, I want to abide in you so that I can produce that fruit. The fruit Christ looks for in our life is what is a saint in his life. So this morning, we all need to take a close look at our own lives, examine how we're living, examine our own fruit basket and what we're bringing for the Lord. If there's no fruit in your life this morning, ask you to consider where you're at with the Lord. Consider where you're at with the Lord. Let me ask you this as we close. What's in your fruit basket? What's in your fruit basket this morning? What's going to be in God? What's there? What's missing? Soul? Sanctification? A desire to become more and more like Him every day and applying that? Or the spiritual list that we're given in place is not in Him? Lord, it's spoken in my own heart this week as I've refreshed and studied and prepared my mind to talk 